All righty, welcome. So we are moving into a new unit. The, um, the last unit of this class is about the 19th century, so the 1800s, and um, what happened in the churches. And it specifically is, is looking mostly at American and British churches. There is a chapter on the 19th century, but it doesn't spend as much time in the, in the European continent. Um, and then it sadly, as the rest of the book has, completely ignores the rest of the world. And we're gonna uh, we're gonna address that with some things after we're done with the text. But this is jumping into our last unit here, and it begins with an essay on the revival of missionary efforts. And uh, early in the early in uh, Protestant history, people were trying to evangelize Catholics and trying to get them to become Protestants. Um, and it wasn't until relatively recently that we started to see missionary efforts to pagans. So uh, early Christians, apostles, evangelized the pagans. And then for some reason, that kind of got put on the back burner uh, for a long time. And it starts up again here. So today's objective is to become familiar with the shifting focus from survival toward evangelism that occurred from the 17th to the 19th centuries. Um, a lot of the story of Christianity that we have covered has been how not to get killed. And after the, the Peace of Osberg, and after the uh, the British island works out the fact that you can be whatever faith you want, um, then people are free to say, okay, I, I can live my life and have my faith and be the kind of Christian that I am, and nobody's going to kill me for it. And so now I can start to look at saving other people as opposed to just being, you know, running for my life all the time. So we're looking at, uh, at a shift in emphasis. And uh, if you don't want to write down absolutely every word, that's fine. Uh, get the spirit of this. Okay, so. If you have to write down the other That would be right. <laughs> So during the wars of persecution following the revolution, evangelism was targeted at Catholics. And we've seen that a lot. The, you know, Luther did his thing, and then the Lutherans were struggling for survival. And so um, when a Lutheran went out to evangelize, a Lutheran didn't necessarily go into some pagan nation. A Lutheran decided, I'm going to be an, I'm going to be an evangelist. I'm going to try to bring Catholics over to my side of the issue. Um, and the same thing for the Reformed churches. The Reformed churches, when they decided to become missionaries, didn't pick up and move to Africa. The Reformed church people, when they became missionaries, <laughs> talked to Catholics. And so there was a lot of um, siblings of the faith, you could say, one branch of the body of Christ trying to convince the other branch of the body of Christ that their branch was the right one. And so you have, you have a lot of internal dialogue but not a lot of external dialogue. And that's very sad to see because Christ told us to go and make disciples of all the nations, not just to argue amongst each other about whose doctrine is best. So for a long time, that wasn't happening. Pagans were not the target of evangelism for several hundred years. You don't see missions organizations. You don't see people moving and going abroad to spread the gospel like the apostles had. So for a long time, that's not happening. And then it starts to occur after the religious wars stop, or at least die way down. Um, there are still some armed conflicts between Catholics and Protestants, but uh, not nearly what it used to be. And there are still some uh, conflicts between different Protestant groups even, but not nearly what it had been. For the most part, by the time that the 1800s are rolling around, People are at peace with themselves and their neighbors, and you could be any kind of Jesus lover and be okay. And then Jonathan Edwards, uh, well, he started lots of awesome things, right? We've already talked about him in the last student as the founder of the, the uh, instigator of the Great Awakening. Um, he was a fantastic preacher, and he was also uh, the one who, who started the modern missionary movement. Now, you'll hear people criticize the Reformed churches and the Reformed theology. You'll hear people say, well, they're bad evangelists because they don't think that 
human will comes into play, and so all you've got to do is let God save people, so why are you going to become a missionary? Uh, but Jonathan Edwards, definitely a Calvinist, definitely of the Reformed tradition, um, but he was also very, very concerned for evangelism. Um, and he wrote a pamphlet. Uh, it's, I, I wish I had a copy of it because it's, um, it is so significant in church history. It started so many people on the road to become missionaries, but I don't have a copy of it. Uh, but it's short. It's not a full-on book. It's, you know, 20-something pages. Um, and he, he argued for the need for evangelism. And this is at a time when people weren't doing that. You know, today we live in an age where there are massive organizations of missions all around the world. And Jonathan Edwards did not live in such a time. There was not that machinery. And he writes a book, a little pamphlet, and he, he gets published, and he says, guys, we should be about this. Jesus was about this. So we need to be doing this. Uh, as a result, there was a group of people, 12 men, and they formed the Particular Baptist Missionary Society. Particular does not mean strange. Particular Baptist, for some reason, I don't know why they chose that name, but it's the group of Baptists that are five-point Calvinists. That what, that's what the, that group is. And the Particular Baptists are still around. That's still a denominational name. It's the full-on five-point Calvinist version of Baptists. Most Baptists are three-point Calvinists. Um, the the full-on Calvinists are call themselves particular Baptists. So these these guys, twelve of them, they scraped together thirteen pounds. We don't use that unit of currency today. The pound is almost two dollars. It's like a buck eighty five. So um, in today's money, that's twenty six dollars. Um, that's not a whole lot of money. Um, back in that day, it would have been worth more. You know, you could get more for twenty six dollars. But still, it's not a ton of money. You know, maybe in that day it would have felt like having uh, $100 or $150. But these 12 guys get together and they say, we're going to be about evangelism. And how much do you have to contribute to the cause? And they pull out what they can and they put together their money and they say, okay, we've got 12 people and we've got 100 bucks. And we're going to go change the world with 12 people and $100. 12 people and not a lot of money did it before, right? Jesus' apostles were not wealthy people. Um, and they decide they're going to do it. William Carey was one of them. And he went to a pub, because that's what you do, right? To go chats like Facebook. You, you want to go talk about what's going on, you go to the pub. Um, he went to a pub after the meeting of the Missionary Society. And, uh, and he was talking about how excited he was that they're going to go save the world. And some, some guy down the, down the counter looked at him and made fun of him. And the quote is in your book. You read the book. The quote is in there that says, uh, if God wants to save the heathen, he'll do it without you. In other words, if Jesus wants those poor people in some other part, one part of the world to know him, then he'll just miraculously step in and save those people. And William Carey says, uh, no, he needs people to do it. Yes, it's God that saves people, but he saves them through missionaries, right? Through people going and telling the gospel. So William Carey, it, instead of fighting back and arguing and making a big scene, William, William Carey said, fine, uh, I'm going to show that you're wrong, and I am going to go be used by the Lord. And so he took his little bit of money, and he went to India. Uh, and, you, you know, today, if you decide you're going to go to India, you hop aboard a plane, and it might take you uh, a day or two of flying to get to India, but you'll get there, you know, without too much trouble. Throw down enough money, and you'll get there pretty lightly. But he is in uh, New England. He's got to take a boat from New England to Old England, right? To back to the uh, back to Europe, and then he's got to take a series of ships to sail around Africa. And then he's going to wind up in India. Like, that's a long journey. That's months and months and months of traveling. Um, and so he decided he was going to go do that. And he wound up in India. He was there. Oh, there's the packet. Um, the, this is the pamphlet that encourages missions. It's a, it's a biography of David Brainerd. And in it, Jonathan Edwards argues for the importance of missions. So that's the little pamphlet that he 
there you go. Here's the particular Baptist society. This is the 12 guys, and they met in that little house, and it's a bad picture. One of them in here is William Carey, and there's William Carey. He looks kind of like George Washington, I think, on the, on the dollar bill. Um, but William Carey spends 41 years in, in India with no break. Today's missionaries don't do that. Today's missionaries will go and be on mission for a year or two, and then will journey back to their home to drum up more financial support, get more people on board with them, uh, tell the churches that have been supporting them what's going on, and then they'll go back to work. And then they take these little breaks called furloughs, and that's kind of a, a modern uh, addition to the missionary model. But in the days when it took months and months to journey between the mission field and home, it, it doesn't really make sense to do that. Because let's say it takes four months to go home. Then you're going to spend some time talking to people, and then you're going to get on a boat and go four months back. It's, it's a year, at least, that you're gone. Um, from your work. And so William Carey didn't do that. When he got to India, he stayed in India. 41 years of service. He was a linguist. Um, he was very good at language. And in all likelihood, he probably had um, some, some manifestation of the gift of tongues because he was incredible at language. He was fluent in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, which allowed him to read the Bible in its original languages, and he was able to translate the Bible from the original languages, and then not only was he fluent in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, but he learned 20 different dialects that are spoken in India. And today we don't live in a place where there are multiple dialects spoken. Here on the island, it's English, right? Now there are versions of that. There's Pidgin, right? Um, and people who speak Pidgin, uh, they have different different grammar and, and different uh, words that they use. And there are people who, because of their ethnicity, that they moved here, they also speak another language, like, you know, uh, Chinese people might speak English when they're out of the marketplace, but at home they speak Chinese or something of that nature. But back in India, in William Carey's time, it was... It was much more diverse in dialect spoken. So you can go from village to village, and the language of trade, the language of commerce, the language of government changes from village to village to village. And so if you're going to minister to people in multiple villages, you have to know lots of languages. Um, and so the, uh, he became fluent in 20 different dialects spoken in India. And then he set out to give them Bibles. What an amazing thing. He... He knew Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, so he could take the original Greek and the original Hebrew and write it into a different language. And he oversaw the translation of the Bible into 40 languages. He himself didn't do all of them, but he was the editor or the overseer for the work. 40 different Bible translations came out of his, his ministry. Um, he printed 200,000 copies of the Bible in these various different languages and distributed the Bible throughout India. It had never been done before. Uh, and the cool thing is, he, he did it on a salvaged printing press. He actually went to a British newspaper in India. India at the time was a British property. And they had thrown away a printing press because it was broken and old and they had bought a new one. And he dug it out of the trash and he used that salvaged printing press to print 200,000 copies of the Bible. So awesome work, awesome resourcing, awesome conservation of, of money. Um, he had a lot of personal tragedy and sacrifice. If you read his biography, um, he had all kinds of things go wrong in his family. Um, he, was, he was very well respected by the Christians in India who became Christians because of his work. But anytime people leave paganism and come to the cross, you see the people who don't leave paganism become hostile. And, and that happened there, too. His printing press and his uh, ministry headquarters were burned down to the ground. And uh, he lost everything. He lost all of his notes. He lost all of the original manuscripts that he had put all the work into to make. He lost the press. 
all of it turned into ash. And um, his people that were working with him stood next to him as they watched this thing burn down. And they said, well, are you going back to America? Like, is this the end of your ministry? And he said, the Lord takes, the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, the Lord of Job. And then he just started praying that God would send resources and he could get it going again. And it, it took him two years, but two years after the fire, he had a brand new printing press. And the news had gotten back to England. That his, that his facility had burned down, and some wealthy person said, I'm going to buy you a new printing press, which is not cheap. And they shipped him a brand new printing press, and somebody else paid for the construction of a new facility that was larger than the facility that he had before. And people in America found out that this had happened, and Greek and Hebrew scholars from universities decided to go and help him reestablish his work. So it took him two years to get back together, but when he got back together, it was a bigger building with a newer press and more people helping. So uh, God was faithful, and God led him through really hard times. But through all at all, he did an amazing amount of work for the kingdom of God um, in India. So this is him, and this is his famous quote, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. Um, and so just because you acknowledge that God is the one doing the work, you don't sit on your hands. right? And I think that this is something that when you have a high view of the sovereignty of God, and you know that God is in charge of everything, and there is no place in your in your worldview for a mistake um, when it comes to God allowing something in your life. Some people then say, well, God's in charge of everything, I don't have to do anything. And William Carey said, no, God's in charge of everything. It's his work, and he's going to save people. But don't sit on your hands. Be about the work. Do something. Um, you can't steer a ship that isn't sailing. You can't steer a car that isn't driving do something with your life and then allow God to turn you into the direction that he wants you to go. Um, this is just a, a picture of him baptizing uh, Indians and they they came to know the gospel by the thousands. He was very successful in evangelism um, and people were hungry for the gospel and because they wound up getting Bibles in their language and can read it for themselves um, they came to Christ in very large numbers. Um, and this is his gravestone. Um, this is William Carey, Doctor of Divinity, born August 17, 1761, died June 9, 1834. Um, and so this is his uh, this is his grave marker. He died in India, and uh, he is there, he is still buried there. Okay. Another guy, um, also moved by Edwards Packet. Uh, by Edwards pamphlet, Adonai Ram Judson. I love the name Adonai Ram. I think that's really cool. Um, don't see it here anymore. But Adonai Ram Judson, uh, he read the packet and and he decided to go to India as well. So he goes to Calcutta, but it's, it's interesting. He changed his denomination on the boat. Not something that you normally see a missionary do. So he had um, he had gathered a group of supporters to pay for his work and support him in missionary uh, efforts. And he was a Congregationalist, which came out of the Anglican Church. And um, he got on the boat as a Congregationalist with the Congregationalist Church funding him. And then along the way, he discovered that he was no longer a Congregationalist. And he agreed more with the Baptist perspective of things. So he uh, formally changed from being a Congregationalist to being a Baptist, and by so doing, stepped outside of the church that had decided to support him. So he got off the boat with no support and uh, wound up in India. He went, to, um, he went to William Carey's ministry and learned kind of what Carey was doing and was apprenticed under Carey for a little bit in India. And then he felt called to Burma. Um, does anybody know where Burma is? It's no longer called Burma today. It just is, has your knowledge of Southeast Asia. Myanmar. Myanmar is what it's called now. Myanmar. So if you're looking at a map, India is um, you know that big thing in the middle of, of Central Asia. And then you go to the right, and um, Myanmar is between there, and then when you get into like the the Vietnam area, uh, Myanmar is in between that. And so he left to Burma, and he uh, didn't speak 
the language of the Burmese people. And so he had, he had a lot of work to do. He got to Burma with no support, remember? He, he walked away from the church that was going to support him. So he has to earn his own money as he goes. Um, he walked away from that. He goes to a people group that he doesn't speak the language, and he decides that he's going to evangelize them. So for three years, he, does, he works in, in a, at a trade and tries to learn how to talk to people. And after th three years, he can, he can speak the language. Um, in the meantime, he's got, he took his family with him, took his wife, and his wife has two stillborn babies um, during the three years that he's learning the language. So talk about a hard life. You're there to serve the Lord, but you can't talk to the people yet. And you don't have anybody supporting you financially. And so you're, you're working and you're doing everything you can to su support yourself and figure this out. And in the meantime, two babies die. The, the, the hardship and the mental anguish that must have been upon him was amazing. Even after he's, he declared himself able to communicate, and he says, okay, I know the language, and he started aggressively trying to evangelize people in the name of Christ, it took him three more years before the per first person came to know the Lord. So six years of ministry before he had one convert. Um, and, and I don't know if you can imagine how frustrating that could have been, too. Uh, but six years before his first convert. Eventually, he has 18 converts, but it takes him 12 years. He's in Burma for 12 years, and he has 18 people come to know the Lord. Now, he was apprenticed under William Carey, who was having thousands and tens of thousands of people come to know Christ. So that's his mentor. And then he goes on his work, and he spends 12 years doing it, he loses two babies, and he has 18 converts. Now, praise the Lord for 18 souls. But you gotta, you got to think there must have been something in his mind going, what am I doing wrong? I left, I left this other guy's ministry. Tens of thousands of people come to know the Lord, and now I've got, I've got 18 people. Uh, but the Lord used those 18 people to plant a seed, and there are still Christians in Burma today um, that, whose, whose legacy is derived from Adonai Ram Justin's work. So... Um, God used him, and the church in Burma is still there, but um, he had a hard life and a hard road. And so, you know, as a, as a missionary, you can't always judge God's favor on your life based on how many people you're seeing come to know them. Three Scottish Presbyterians you should know just the names of. I'm not going to go into as much detail for them, but these are um, Scotsmen who who decided that God had put it upon their life to evangelize the lost. Um, David Livingstone was the first missionary to Africa. Um, really cool biography if you, if you are into reading biographies. David Livingstone um, kind of just wandered around Africa talking about Jesus to everybody who would listen to him. He, he went um, on his own without a lot of support and a lot of uh, entourage. And he didn't really have a whole lot of plans about how long he was going to stay in any one place and where he was going to go when he was done. He just kind of went where he felt the Lord calling him to go and uh, did a great work in planting the church in, in Africa. Um, John Getty is the first missionary to Polynesia. Um, Polynesia, obviously, we are close to here in Hawaii. Um, and he was the first one to find the courage to go and evangelize cannibals. And um, he eventually was killed by cannibals, but um, he had a long missionary life before that wound up happening to him. So he found the courage to go where other people were afraid to go. And eventually he paid the price for it, but uh, the Lord used him mightily. Um, his particular uh, mission field that he spent the most time at, at that time was called the New Hebrides. Today that nation is called Vanuatu. And uh, Vanuatu has only been an independent nation since the 80s. Um, they were a British property during the time that he was there. And um, for a long time since, they were a British property. They've only been independent, like I said, since the 80s, so about 30 years. Uh, the, uh, the people group there, I have a little bit of a tie to. I went on a missions trip to Vanuatu as well and helped distribute Bibles. And when they had been written in another of the languages that Vanuatu people speak, 
Uh, and so, uh, I, you know, obviously I was not a pioneer, but I went long, long after the fact. Uh, but I've also been as a missionary to the to Vanuatu. It's pretty cool to uh, realize the the way was paved by this guy who ultimately gave his life for that work. William Charles, or sorry, William Chalmer Burns was the first missionary to China. He stayed along the coast, and so um, he planted a couple of Christian churches right along the coast there, and we had the first Christian Chinese because of him. Just some pictures here. Livingstone and his wanderings, and so um, he, had, he had lots of just kind of journeying around Africa. And when you look at where he went, sometimes it looks like he couldn't decide where he was going to go because he goes back and forth several times. But that's just, he was following the Lord's leading. And he, he would stay somewhere until he decided he was done. And then he'd go somewhere else. And it wasn't necessarily systematic. He just decided, I'm going to go there. Um, he has a cool quote, If you have men who will only come if they know there is a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there is no road at all. Uh, so just that, that's a cruel sense of resolve. That he's going to go where the Lord leads him, whether or not it's easy. Uh, this is the uh, the Getty guy who went to the New Hebrides. Whenever I see his picture, I feel like he looks kind of like a goofy Abraham Lincoln. Um, but that he, he had the pluck that others didn't. And these are the sorts of folks that he would minister to. Uh, that's, uh, that's the Vanuatu traditional, like, war dress paint sorts of things that they still dress like that for you know ceremonies and festivals and things of that nature but they would have been like that all the time when uh when he went there kind of intimidating to see and then william of calmers burns the longing of my heart is to make known my glorious redeemer to those who have never heard he's a he's a white guy but you will notice when you see a picture of him that he very quickly adapted as much as he could to the Chinese cultural norms. So his dress and um, the way he kept his hair, he, he tried to become as Chinese as a white guy could um, when he went there and tried to blend in as much as possible and, uh, and adapt their culture. And so even in some of his sermons, he would try to make references to Chinese cultural norms or Chinese history. Um, very different from the last guy I'm going to talk about, Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor started the China Inland Mission. He wasn't content to stay along the, the coast where there were other foreigners. He wanted to go inland where there were no other foreigners. He wanted to go to where the Chinese people had only ever seen Chinese people. And so he ventured into inland China and set up a work there. He had lots of success. Uh, the Chinese uh, missionaries uh, now are kind of walking down the, the roads that Hudson Taylor blazed for them. Um, there are Chinese churches that are long established, that are still there today, uh, that are even recognized by the government of China as being legitimate churches um, that were planted by Hudson Taylor. He survived the Boxer Rebellion, and if you have not heard about that, the Chinese have always kept to themselves. They've always been kind of isolationist in their, in their attitude towards foreigners. That's why Britain had to open up China with, with military force to force them to allow trade with the West. Uh, and after a while of seeing foreigners in China, there was this rebellion where they killed foreigners. Uh, they gave them warning. They said, you need to leave the country by this day. And if not, on this day, we will kill everybody who's not Chinese. And uh, Hudson Taylor decided to stay. And so uh, we trusted the Lord to protect him. The Boxer Rebellion happened. Lots of not Chinese people were killed, uh, yeah, true to the word of the Boxer group. And, um, but Hudson Taylor was not. Hudson Taylor survived. He was protected by the Lord, um, and his, his work continued. And uh, he was surrounded, obviously, by Chinese Christians, and so there was, there was some protection for him because of that. But uh, he was, at that point, probably one of the only non-Chinese people living in China uh, who was allowed to stay. His family had a huge price for his commitment. Lots of his children died at a young age in China because he would not leave and get better medical care. 
he decided that he had been called to China, he was going to stay in China, and if the Lord took his children home, then while that is sad, that wasn't a reason to leave his work. So uh, some people have looked at him and said that he was an abusive father, and and I suppose that you can see that you can see it that way. Your kid is sick. There is medical care for you if you took the kid somewhere else and you decide not to take the kid somewhere else. That's that's pretty harsh. And in today's world, that would that would be constituted as neglect. Hudson Taylor though saw it as just a price to pay for the work that God had called him to. So. Um, not necessarily the best family man, but an amazing missionary. And his wife was on board. It's not like his wife was telling him, hey, we need to leave and take this child to the hospital. Uh, his wife was on board with what they were doing, and they prayed, and the Lord did not heal, and they lost several children. Uh, so uh, you can see that, you know, through several different lenses. But he was very committed to his work. Different than Burns, though, Burns tried to look like a Chinese guy with pale skin. Um, this is Hudson Taylor. He still looks like, uh, still looks like a European. Um, and he dressed like a European the whole time he was there. He made no effort to blend in. Um, so this is Hudson Taylor. He has lots of cool quotes. Uh, one of them is, Christ is either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. In other words, if you believe that Jesus is in charge of your life, live like it. Don't say Jesus is in charge of my life and live how you want to. Because if you live the way you want to, you your mind. And you say Jesus is your Lord. Um, very, very much inspiring guy. Uh, God uses men who are weak and feeble enough to lean on him. I think that's very, very cool as well. If you think that you're strong enough to do the work God has called you to, you're wrong. And you won't get it done. So, there you go. Uh, one more. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's provision. That's it. That's it. That's it. I think that's it. So, these guys help bring us into the modern age of and uh, there we are. Thank you.